How is it? Oh, okay. There we go. All right. As I was saying, good morning. And you can tell from the video and what was read where we're going today. Um, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bible and you want to turn to it, please join me there. But this is how Jesus opens the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. These words that open the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel are coming within a long sermon Jesus has been preaching since chapter 5. Jesus is in one of the longest dialogues in Scripture, talking to a hillside of people. And he's saying, Do not judge. Jesus is continuing to teach us in chapter 7 what the kingdom of heaven is like. How we will behave when we're there. How it's run. And that earth prepares our hearts now for when we get to heaven. Evangelist Billy Graham, you've probably heard this story, tells this, this account of a man walking down the street and he sees a stonemason chipping away at a block of stone. And intrigued, he says to the mason, why are you doing that? And the stone mason says, I'm forming it down here so it will fit up there. By this point, no one who has been taking Jesus' words seriously will feel much like judging anyone else anyway. Still, If you're like me, we seem to like to apply ethics to other people. Like how many times have I come to a church and listening to the sermon thought to myself, boy, I wish so-and-so was here today to hear that message. (laughs) And I suspect we don't even realize we're doing it. The thoughts just like pop in there. I think it's partially because rather than face ourselves, it's easier to look out and judge others than turn the camera, turn the mirror on ourselves. We know Jesus isn't talking about when we properly judge. There are good judgments to be made in life. Judging if this person is the right one for me to marry based on their character. Or listening to two sides of a story and making a judgment based on the facts on how to discipline the issue. Or judging, what's the weather like outside and what should I wear? Or what to spend your money on? What politician to support? Should I continue listening to that song I'm listening to? These are good judgments to be made. The ability to make judgments is a God-given attribute. Scripture teaches that people who place their faith in Jesus, what the world calls Christians, what Churches called born-again believers, what we call disciples of Christ, we will judge the world and angels. That is a sobering thought. Christians will judge the world and angels. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 through 3 inform us of this. It says, or do you not know that Christians will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, Are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So the ability to make judgments is good because it is from God. Jesus, however, is addressing how sin has twisted that good thing and we start using it on each other. The tone is of, don't make a practice of this type of judging. The habit is easy to form, and the results are disastrous. An author preacher from the third century named Chrysostom said, to judge others, thou art making the judgment seat dreadful to thyself, and the account strict. 
It's possible to be critical of others, which invites others to be critical of us. Meaning, the measure you use, that measure will be returned to you. I read a scholar who believed that when Jesus says these words, do not judge others, the measure you use will be used upon you. Jesus is actually referring to an ancient practice that comes from the Jewish marketplace. That during a grain contract, it was frequently specified that a grain delivery and payment would be measured using the very same instrument, that of the purchaser. Meaning, you want someone's grain? You bring your scales, and the seller puts their grain on your scale in the amount you've asked for and measures it out, and then your payment is placed on that same scale so that no one can claim fraud happened. When I think about what Jesus says in these two verses about judging other people, the Holy Spirit reminds me Jesus is the one who is about to be judged. That soon enough, as Jesus spoke these very words, do not judge so that you will not be judged. He knows he's the one who is going to be judged by God because of me. The person he's talking to, Because of my sin, he's going to be judged. And recall the standard of measurement used upon Jesus, his own perfect holy law with the accompanying punishment of the wrath of God. Now, we, thankfully, praise God, should not fear God's wrath as Christians. For although we were by nature children of wrath, and you know that's from Ephesians 2, the promise of faith in Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come, says 1 Thessalonians. So when we meditate on the wrath of God, we should be amazed to think that Jesus Christ bore the wrath of God that was due us because of our sin. That in order that we'll be spared from it. To think about Jesus extinguishing God's wrath for us, we must also think about the patience of God. Psalm 103 mentions both God's patience and his anger in the same psalm, saying the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins. In fact, the delay of the execution of God's wrath upon evil is for the purpose of leading us to repentance. Mm. God withholds ex- executing his righteous judgment because of the pass- he uses the passage of time to bring conviction of sin with the accompanying repentance in each one of us. For the purpose that our relationship with him will thrive. I mean, what grace on the part of God to withhold my judgment, to give me time to repent. I know that up here, but this baby right here is a factory that loves to produce judgments. To judge maliciously. That is hard to, I should say, to not judge maliciously is hard to do when it lands in my own backyard. I want swift justice, which usually involves loss and pain for my perpetrator. That is how my judgment works, quick, with little to no mercy. Some are laughing. (laughs) But God says he withholds his judgment, so that more will come to repentance. How? With what? We'll get to that here in a moment, but to quote Robert Frost, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled, and it's made all the difference. So church, let's diverge for a moment. Another voice from Scripture addressing the same judgmental attitude Jesus is talking about here in Matthew's Gospel 
the judging of others when we're guilty of probably doing the very same things. The Apostle Paul in Romans 2, 4 writes, Or do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you, who's reading this, to repentance? Uh-oh. We're in the crosshairs of God on that one. Wow. What a scripture. I wish so-and-so would have shown up to church to hear that one. <laughs> God says, uh, Eric, this sermon, that scripture is meant for you. When I think of God's kindness, thanks to a conversation I had with our dear sister Kelly, I think of the opening story in the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John. I know you know it well. It's the real-life account story known as an adulterous woman. A woman has been caught committing the very act of adultery. Now, her accusers exercise a rightful judgment based upon solely and according to the very law of God that will soon judge Jesus. The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And to do so meant death. In Jewish law, to be caught in the act of adultery equals a death sentence when you're caught. So, Jesus, the law of Moses says, to, that commands us to stone a woman like this, what do you say? You know the story. How does Jesus respond? We see Jesus being extremely patient. Instead of immediately agreeing to her death, he quietly bends down, and with his finger, he writes in the dirt. Not once, but twice. Rather than judge, which he had full right to do, Jesus instead is patient with her, with them, her accusers. Hmm. What is so beautiful to me and Kelly as we discuss this story is the kindness Jesus displayed so vividly in that moment. During that scenario, in her story and in mine. What won Kelly and myself to Jesus? Love, yes. But specifically, the kindness Jesus showed to us over and over and over again. It was the kindness of Jesus which won both of us to himself. We knew how sinful we were, are, and that like this adulterous woman, we deserve death. We rightfully deserve to die for our sins. And we are amazed we have gotten so far in this life because Psalm 51.5 shockingly tells us, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Verses like that help us, Kelly and I, recognize we deserve death. We were disadvantaged right from birth, broken with a taste for sin. And yet, time and time again, God exercised patience with us, knowing full well by giving us years of life, we would think up all kinds of sins and do all kinds of sins all by ourselves. We didn't need any help with it. It came so naturally to us. I've committed so many sins, I lost count decades ago. If I could actually keep track. Listen to something from the book of Hosea's second chapter. God told Hosea about his adulterous wife. Hosea has a wife who is committing adultery over and over and over again. And she, her name is Gomer, represents the nation of Israel. So God is speaking to Hosea about his adulterous wife, comparing her to his wife, his love, Israel. And God's talking to him about the stuff God is going to do. Like build a wall against her. Remove her food and clothing from her. 
that God would prevent her from finding the illicit love she is after. But then in verse 14, God says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her, bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. Meaning, I will pull her away to a private place and I will show my kindness to her and it will win her back. And that word kindly literally means upon her heart. Meaning, God would speak to her heart as only a true husband can. And the result, and they will sing like in the days of her youth. For Kelly and I, it is his kindness that wins us over again and again. And Kelly sings. Boy, does she sing. His patient kindness is always there, always accessible, always attracting us back. And I could come up with story upon story about God's kindness being shown, even shown through other people, like Hosea being patient and kind with his adulterous wife so as to win her back to him. Like Joseph being patient and kind to his conniving brothers, which led to their repentance before the book of Genesis comes to a close. Like God being patient and kind with Noah, who took a very long time to build the ark. And there are millions upon billions of examples not found in the Bible of how patient Jesus has been with all of humanity. Hundreds upon thousands of examples from our own lives of how Jesus has been patient and kind with us. Church, by this point in Jesus' sermon, no one taking his words seriously should feel much like judging anyone else anyways. Jesus is teaching we should not wrongfully judge. Why? Why? Because as he utters these merciful words, do not judge so that you will not be judged. He speaks them knowing full well he is the one who's going to be judged. For us, that humbles me. It's like in the last chapter we were just in, Matthew 6, verse 12, where Jesus teaching us to pray says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When Jesus was teaching us how to pray, specifically how to pray for forgiveness, he know he is going to be the one to pay the debt forgiveness owes. So when he says, do not judge, he knew who would be the one that would be judged in our place. Will we even allow such kindness in here to change it? Why did you do it, Jesus? And it was your scale used. Your own holy, perfect scale being used upon yourself. You want to purchase their forgiveness? Yes, Father, Jesus replies. Then this is what it's going to cost you. My stored up cup of wrath. My deadly, angry, obliterating wrath. And as Jesus bore the guilt of our sin alone, God the Father, the mighty creator, the Lord of the universe, put the cup of his wrath to his son's lips. And Jesus became the object of intense hatred of sin and vengeance against sin. God has been patiently storing up since the beginning of time. God had not simply forgiven our sins in the past, and forgotten about the punishment that was due to our sin in generations past. No. He had forgiven the sin, yes. But he had been storing up his angry wrath against the committing of sins. And he unleashed it on his own son. For you. For me. And I am so grateful it was only a cup and not an ocean, because that is the amount of wrath I would think God had stored up 
since the beginning of time that we've committed. Sin after sin after sin. By this point, church, no one who has been taking Jesus' word seriously will feel much like judging anyone else anyway. I'm left deflated. And we're not even done with Scripture yet. Jesus continues. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, or out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will be able to clearly see to take the speck that is out of your brother's eye. So, some would summarize what those verses, verses 3 through 5 just said by saying, God is teaching us to see the best in others and the worst in ourselves. Hmm. That is good. But it only goes so far. I think the better approach is to say, see the best in Jesus, his sacrifice, his kindness, his patience, his love for us. Let me ask you a question. How many splinters do you think were in that cross Jesus hung upon that day? Break down the cross into individual splinters like the sand on the sea, sure, and count them if you could. How many splinters were used to build that cross? Jesus uses humor to bring out the contrast between our excellent ability to point out the faults in others and our own myopia in discerning our own. A splinter in someone's eye might render that person temporarily blind and uncomfortable, <laughs> but a plank embedded in your own eye would render you dead. Galatians 2.20 teaches us, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live for the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. Amen. The hyperbole is graphic. Imagine a zealous Christian walking around with a log protruding from their eye. As if it would even fit. Totally ignorant of their grotesquely Horrible state. You see the splinter in someone's eye? Okay. Then see the plank upon which Jesus died with his blood running down, covering them. They that little splinter. See the plank upon which Jesus died for them, for you. Anyone who has been taking Jesus' word seriously won't feel much like judging anyone else anyway. I've had numerous eye examinations in my life. I once even had LASIK eye surgery to correct my vision, and I appreciate the tenderness of the physician who performed the surgery. There is one more example of how Jesus displayed his patient kindness in Scripture that I want to share with us. It is when he called to himself his disciples. Do you think Jesus demanded the disciples clean themselves up before they came to him? No. Jesus loved them just as they are. Just as they were. Knowing that time spent with him inevitably would start to change them from the inside out. Just where they were at. Jesus didn't beat me over the head. Didn't beat Wesley over the head to get into the kingdom. His kindness wooed us. He pulled us to a private place and he wooed us saying, I love you. I'm judged for you. I love you just as you are and who I believe you can become. No one who has been taking Jesus' word seriously will feel much like judging anyone else. Do I believe I can do this? Not a chance without him. So join me now as we go into prayer and let us all ask the one who can do this work in us to self see Jesus as the one judged so we could go free.
Father God, I did not um, initially appreciate this text to preach because it is convicting to me every single day. These are the words that really just cut through every barrier I throw up and says, look at me, see me. Father, I have done horrible things in my life and you pull me always into this quiet place and you speak tenderly upon my heart as only a true husband can. And you say, I love you. Why do you love me, Jesus? Because I, lo I am loved. How do you love me, Jesus? He says, look to that cross. Father, but I've committed so many sins. And he's like, like all those splinters in there, they're covered. Because of me, they're covered. It was my blood. Father, each one of us here today are struggling with this very topic in one way or another. Maybe they have heard a message today and they thought, wow, I needed, so-and-so needed to hear this. Help turn that comment on ourselves and say, I needed to hear this. And then, Father, please give the presence of the Holy Spirit in each one of our hearts the power to remember these words when we want to judge to be, be stopped abruptly and say, whoa, Jesus was judged. I'm going to not say anymore. I'm not going to think that thought anymore. Father, thank you for the good gift of judging and help formulate us here on earth so that when we get in heaven and we judge the world and we judge angels, we do it with you smiling and saying, that's my son, that's my daughter. Father, there are so many things. I, 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 I hope right now, Holy Spirit, you're rising up in people and they're praying along with me. They're specifics because you have earned our trust and our thanks and our praise. Yes. And we just give you that thanks love and praise in your mighty son's name, Jesus Christ, who is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Yes. Amen. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday out there in the world. Praise God. We'll see you next Sunday.